studly but <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is that uh, we had an awful hard time uh, trying to find something to drop our uh, first parachutist with. We spent a year getting everything to work and then we just about spent another year trying to get a suitable drop plane. Uh, what we didn't realize that almost any uh, 40 size trainer makes a great drop plane. You just have to do a few modifications, defend, depending on the type of uh, diameter you have. Well, the doorbell rung, and I got a little Maltese here. He never says a word, not a word, until the doorbell rings. And when the doorbell rings, uh, he barks, and uh, it sounded like he knocked everything in the room over. But anyway, what I was talking about, we spent, uh, oh my, well, uh, nearly a year uh, trying to get a, a, uh, a parachute dude made and a, uh, a parachute. We ordered uh, plans from RC Modeler uh, and the, for the little parachute guy was okay with some modifications, but the parachute was impossible to decipher. So I had to go over to a skydiving club and look at their parachutes. And uh, so me and my wife came home. I designed one and she sewed it up and it worked. Um, but then we realized, well, hey, we don't have anything to drop this thing with. And he weighed two pounds. Excuse me. We thought, well, you know, we're going to have to have something really uh, special to drop this thing. Now, all we had was like low wing hot rod types and... Uh, so one of our guys, there's four of us uh, on the what we call our skydiving team. One of them uh, was relatively new, and he had an old trainer. Uh, and one of them worked at, the, at a motel here in town. It, it was like three stories. So we took it down there up onto the third story balcony and threw it off the motel. But by the time the parachute would get inflated and all, it'd be like two seconds and it'd be on the ground. So we couldn't tell if it was going to steer or if it was going to travel forward. And so we, in desperation, we thought, well, we'll try to uh, fix Jamie's trainer. We didn't know if it would haul it or not. So we, <laughs> we put a makeshift uh, drop mechanism on it. And uh, we didn't want to uh, risk our brand new skydiver in a crash, so uh, we strapped a can of pork and beans on it that weighed uh, basically what our skydiver did. And it got it off the ground finally, but uh, with that extra weight, it squatted the gear all out and it created a lot of drag in the grass. But we did get it off the ground and got it up in the air just to that place, you know, where it's beautiful for your engine to quit. You're too high to uh, get back, uh, <laughs> I mean, you're, you're too high to uh, uh, to go on or you're too low to turn back. But anyway, somebody hollered, lose the beans. So whoever was flying, I don't remember, dropped the beans and we got back to the, the field. But we finally uh, 
got it fixed up and figured well it'll lift it and we strapped the skydiver on there and then we realized we set it down on the ground the wheels didn't touch the ground the skydiver uh, with the parachute and all on was uh, too much the wheels wouldn't touch the ground so somebody suggested we hand launch it i didn't think it would work but you know it did and it did just fine uh, we had a engine on there it wasn't really a hot engine it was like a OS LA 40 and you know they're a good engine but they're not really the most potent in the world well Jamie had a new uh, OS 46 FX and we put that thing on there and it was brand new it hadn't even been broken in but man we flung that thing into the air and it went up just like it uh, didn't have anything on there so uh, we thought hey we've discovered something here any 40 size trainer will make a good jump plane but you need to do a little bit of modification uh, to get the parachute pack to go up inside the plane somewhat and uh, you need a little bit stiffer landing gear to take care of the extra weight the only reason you need that extra landing gear is actually to give you a little more height from the ground and to give you a little more stiffness so uh, I um, bought a uh, SIG Cadet LT40 ARF and did some modifications on that and it is a marvelous jump plane that's the one you saw uh, taken off there on the first of the tape and I'm going to show you step by step what I did to it uh, and it's it's marvelous it you well you can see by the way it took off it it acts like it doesn't even know the weights on there it's it's a fine machine I could recommend it to anybody but if you've got just any 40 trainer with just a little modification you can make a wonderful jump plane out of it okay now this is a, a SIG Cadet LT40 it's the ARF version uh, I just wanted a drop plane and I didn't want to go to the trouble of building one so I sat down one night and began to look through uh, the catalogs and uh, tower talk and such and I didn't have any idea that SIG even had an ARF but I saw this and it had a nice wingspan 70 inch wingspan it was for a 40 engine so I bought one and uh, it's turned out to be a marvelous drop plane it's got a, a big wing that it's got a wider cord than most of the trainers so uh, I brought that dude home and uh, started to work on it. It uh, the, well, another reason I liked it. It it's covered in uh, oh I don't remember it's uh, not ultra coat uh, it's Sig's uh, uh, plastic covering, but it was covered all white, and of course they had uh, their decals in the kit that you could use, but uh, I didn't use them because we have built a. Uh, a large jump plane, uh, jump plane, um, a um, Robin Hood 99. Uh, of course, we had to modify it somewhat to, for our jumpers, and the wing was in one piece. So I made a center section and made it two. Well, actually, it's what a three-piece wing, I guess, two wing panels in the center section. And um, so I wanted to cover this one more or less to match the big one. The big one we call him Bob. So this one we call Son of Bob, the little S-O-B. <laughs> um, but it, it has turned out to be a great choice. Now I'm going to go over there and, um, well, you can see the cutout there and the landing gear. Now that landing gear did not come with the kit. That is the landing gear off of a uh, SIG Astro Hog biplane. And that nose wheel, as you can see, it's a double strut. It's one of those Fultz uh, nose gear. And um, those uh, landing gear, I think, are one, just one of the many reasons that this thing is such a great drop plane. The landing gear is sturdy. It's not uh, soft. And it doesn't allow the wheels to splay out and cause a lot of drag. Uh, it really goes right on. Uh, so I'm going to get over here now and, and show you uh, some of the reasons uh, that I made that cut out the way I did and I'll show you some parachutists that you won't have to make that type of cut out but with our particular 
jumpers, uh, we have to have a um, a pretty good uh, cut out there because the arms on ours stick out sideways, uh, and the arms on some of the other jumpers just go forward. Uh, I'll show you here just in a second. Of course, this is a little, uh, I don't know if it's a little parachute, you really won't be able to see. The, these are the arms, but I don't have the um, uh, foam rubber on them yet. It's hard to see. I got the foam rubber on the legs, but I don't have his feet on yet. But what the, what I'm trying to show you here is, see, the, the arms on this little dude just go right straight forward with his body. Uh, the legs down this way and the arms up this way. So nothing is sticking out sideways. Well, it's quite easy to make a... Uh, on a plane like this, you can just cut a hole in the bottom, basically, and let his parachute go up in the hole because uh, you don't have to worry about the arms. Well, now, on ours, uh, here, this is, uh, uh, can you see him here? <laughs> yeah, this is Hubert. So you can see the arms on Hubert. Now, of course, we've got extra long arms on him. Uh, that's a whole new story. I'm going to put his short arms back on. But anyway, see, the way these arms stick out, you have to have provisions for these so that when you put the, the parachute up in the cutout, by, his arms are sticking out, you see, sideways. So you've got to make sure that uh, the landing gear or whatever is not in the way. Um, so uh, the type of jumper that you're going to have will uh, dictate the kind of modification that you're going to do. But I'll show you what we did to accommodate our dudes. Uh, of course, this is another one here. This is, can you see him? <laughs> this is Pie Tom, and uh, of course he's not finished yet, but He's the same basic way. Now, you can see that his arms are uh, shorter. Look, this receiver fell out. His arms are shorter, you see. But you still, even when you put him under here, you've got to make provisions uh, for his arms. You've got to make sure that uh, the landing gear isn't in the way of his arms. Whereas on this little dude uh, here, you don't have to worry about his arms sticking out sideways because they just uh, stay straight in line with his body, you see. And this little skydiver here, this sucker is bulletproof. This is designed by Dick Northam in uh, uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. And this body is metal, <laughs> and his legs are foam rubber, and he is all but indestructive. I, I saw him drop one of these up at the uh, parachute rally in September. And by the way, as far as we know, it's the only parachute rally in the country. And they're already making plans for it next year. Um, September the 20th and 21st, or so, I can't remember the exact dates, but anyway, uh, if you're interested in parachuting, that's the place to be because I, I have never run into such a bunch of fine fellas. Even if you don't have your parachute or your plane ready, just come on anyway because uh, I'll be there. And if you don't have your parachute or plane either one with you, I'll take one up and let you jump one of mine because it is such fun uh, and if you're interested and, and want to come you come on because uh, man you can you can jump one of mine old diesel or Hubert or Pi Tom I'll have old Pi Tom ready by the time <laughs> the uh, rally gets here uh, so uh, work and try to get ready because boy it's a lot of fun okay now I'm getting off of the subject here um, I'm going to show you what I did now it was very difficult for me to take a, a brand new airplane I just took it out of the box and it was all covered nice and white and looked so good and I drew the lines off to cut that dude out and it was very difficult for me to start cutting on that brand new airplane but <laughs> it has to be done so now here's the piece that I cut out uh, stick it back up in there see it's that's the piece I cut out. And what it is, uh, it's um, this bulkhead right here. It's the first bulkhead behind the fuel uh, gas tank compartment. I cut it 
flush with that bulkhead, and then I, I measured back, oh, whatever length I needed for the um, for the length of the of this parachute pack. And you know, I can't even remember the dimensions, but it it's really not important because uh, everybody will have a different dimension depending on the size of their parachute pack. But anyway, it goes from this. Um, bulkhead back I can't remember how many inches but the fact is that it went back past where the the landing gear see here's the landing gear blocks that are still in here where I cut this out see uh, I went back past the landing gear with it so I uh, I wanted a, a landing gear with more give me more height under here so I had an extra one off this. I have an Astrohog biplane. So I just put a piece of uh, plywood down here in the floor and bolted it right to it. And I think it's probably an inch and a half. I've moved it back a total of an inch and a half, I would say. Well, I was a little concerned that moving it back just even that little amount uh, might affect the uh, ability to rotate in order to take off, you know, because if the gear's back too far, you just can't rotate. But my concerns were unfounded. I, it handles like a dream. Uh, in fact, it, I don't see how it could handle any better with the landing gear up here where it's supposed to be. Uh, but it didn't bother anything. Uh, and I bought this um, uh, Fultz nose uh, wheel up at our hobby shop. And I can't remember exactly, but I think this is a five and a half inch one. Uh, but uh, they have them that are adjustable. And I would say to buy one of the adjustable ones because when you make your modification, be sure that you have it set up to where you have a little uh, degree or two, three or whatever degrees of uh, incidence with, you know, into the airstream if you know you see what I'm saying uh, like you would on a seaplane you you want to have a little instance built in when it's sitting level you can't really tell here the way I have it set up I don't think but but I put just a, a few degrees and with that adjustable nose wheel you see you could just put it exactly where you wanted it um, now on this one it looks like the landing gear is bent back but it isn't uh, I never thought about it when I was putting it on there but because this being a trainer, it has um, uh, down thrust built into the firewall. And when I put the landing gear on, of course, it is at the same angle as the uh, firewall. And it makes it look like the gear is bent backwards. And I thought, well, I'll go in there and uh, put uh, some shims in there and make it straight. But I started working on it, and I thought, well, my goodness, it's in there. It's really strong, and it's going to be all right. It'll, it'll be fine, and if it's not, I'll do it later. Well, we've got 60 jumps on this plane uh, at, at the present, and it has never given us one minute's problem in any way. The landing gear, the drop mechanism, nothing. I mean, it's just it's been wonderful. Uh, I didn't want a nose wheel airplane because... I don't have any nose wheel airplanes because uh, I always had trouble with them. And uh, when I first got this one, I, I thought I would make a tail dragger out of it, but I got to checking it out. And the the way the rudder is, the rudder is on top of the stabilizer, and it would be difficult to get your tail wheel up through there and get it hooked into the rudder and all. So I decided to go with the tricycle gear, but I decided if I was going to go with a tricycle gear, I was going to make uh, one that was as near indestructible as possible because I see nothing but problems that poor, poor new guys will come out with the, their trainers and of course they're basically all uh, tricycle gear and the nose wheel is always giving them problems. So I'll show you what I've done to mine uh, here in a little bit. I'll get some close-ups. But basically you just measure up and, and how I decided how high to make mine. Of course, I measured the thickness of my pack, but also there is a wooden servo uh, tray in this airplane. And right, this is the 
bottom of that servo tray so I cut right up to the bottom of the servo tray and used it as the roof uh, to my cutout. So that was that was handy because this is a big airplane and there's still tremendous room in there to set my servos on top of this and um, and I put just put some more servo rails in which I'll show you here in a few minutes. But basically now this this is all I did to it. Uh, but of course I had to reroute the um, the throttle and I had to reroute the um, steering cable because with this wheel and with this cutout and having to move the servos uh, you couldn't these holes and everything was already bored it, it's a beautifully complete kit but I just had to reroute it and make new holes so I'll get some close-ups in here and show you exactly what I did it it's no problem it's just it's uh, straightforward and easy to do but uh, I'll show you here uh, with some close-ups in a few minutes of how I went about doing this okay now this right here you can see is the back of the uh, servo tray uh, the plywood servo tray that was in the uh, Kit. And the front of the servo tray is right here about where this uh, throttle servo, there's the throttle. Well, no, that's not the throttle servo, that is the drop mechanism servo. So the, um, the tray ended there. Well, what I did was just put a piece of plywood from, from that end of the tray on the rest of the way up here to this uh, bulkhead so that uh, I'd have a once I filled in the holes in the servo tray where the uh, servos were supposed to go then I would have a, a complete solid roof for my um, cutout and uh, then on the, of course you can't see from this angle but this bulkhead up here where the tank area is you know it's always got a a cut out there so you can slide the fuel tank in and out um, so I put plywood in that from the from the top of this uh, servo tray then down to the bottom I put plywood and then back here at the back uh, I did the same thing I put plywood uh, to enclose then the, the cutout would be totally enclosed um, um, I think you can see that one of the servos here, uh, this servo here, I'm going to have to go back there and move the camera just a little bit so you can see. Okay, now these two servos here, this is toward the rear of the plane. Uh, I'm not sure which one is the, yeah, this one here I think is the elevator and this one I think is the rudder but it really doesn't matter but the point is these servos now are back behind the cutout so they are at the level that the servos would normally have been before I made the cutout I just moved them back uh, and put servo rails in so that these two servos are mounted at, at the normal height um, this servo here, well, I'm going to have to move the camera again, uh, but this servo right here is the throttle servo, and uh, I'll get, get it down here uh, later so that I can uh, get a good shot to show you uh, how uh, I ran the, uh, the, the throttle cable and how I ran the... Um, uh, steering cable for the nose wheel because I, I did have to modify that because the the um, servos were higher uh, so therefore we just had to make a new new road for them I'll show you the the workings of this uh, drop servo this one here now normally when we just we would make a uh, a real quick effort at a drop mechanism we just let this pin 
stick out. See that, that pin right there? Okay, but we had some bad experiences. We, we used just a rubber band over that. And when it get greasy, sometimes it would slip off. And once it dropped our dude out, we, we got about 10 feet and it dropped our parachute dude. And it did more damage to him than uh, if we had uh, dropped him from 500 feet. I, I don't know why, but, but it did. So um, I decided to uh, remedy that. So I built a, um, a little, just a little piece of wood here. Uh, that sawed out there, and when the, this pin came through the side of the fuselage, I let it go. There, I bored a hole, oversized hole in here, and let the pin go all the way through and uh, rest in that hole so that when we put the uh, uh, cord on there and cinched the old dude down, uh, it was really tight, but it, there was no danger of it slipping off of that. Uh, Thing because it couldn't. I'll show you. I'll give you an example here. Uh, just take this cord and just say this was uh, around the parachute guy. Am I in the way here? We put this cord right up here. Okay. Now see that? That is fastened in there. Now, there's no way in the world that's going to come out of there until I hit this switch and then it'll release it but until you hit the switch there's no way that that's going to come out of there and uh, so there's nothing Mickey Mouse about it but before it was just kind of a hit or miss we had a, a great deal of problems with that but now uh, it, it works great and now over we don't use rubber bands on there anymore and the way we get tension on uh, the thing now is over here on this side. Let's see if I can turn it around for you. Old Wally Gitchell sent me this. It's a little cam lock and they're very simple to make and I'll show you how to make one here in a little while. Uh, this loosens it and then you can pull this cord and pull it as tight as you want and when you get it as tight as you want you just push this little lever down and that's got it. It will it'll never move from there. So uh, this is a real positive drop mechanism. Uh, like I said before, we had <laughs> lots of problems until we did these uh, little modifications, and that's all it took. It's a very, very positive system now, and we have absolute, absolutely no problems with it anymore. I this and where I put the servos and everything inside. Well, you can see the the cutout here. Now, see these servos here and here before were uh, down in this. There's a wooden servo tray uh, right here. That's the servo tray is the roof of my cutout, and those um, servos were supposed to be down in that servo tray with the. Uh, uh, the ears uh, about here and the servos on you know down in here so um, I had to mount this one here is the throttle I had to mount it on top of the uh, servo tray and this one here uh, well I'm sorry this one here is the drop mechanism and this one is the throttle now this one for the drop mechanism is actually on, oh, it's about the middle, in about the middle of the, the fuselage in there. And this is the throttle servo, and it is on this side of the, of the fuselage because the um, throttle cable then has to run along here and then Oh, it has to maybe drop down slightly to uh, to go on out here to the engine. Uh, but it, it, it did. I didn't have to move this a lot, but I had to move it so that uh, because it was supposed to be mounted down here. So you can see with the route and the throttle uh, cable from here uh, and here would be different. So you'd have to. Uh, drill different holes. Now later on I'm going to take the um, 
uh, hatch off of the gas tank, take the gas tank out and show you these, uh, thr the throttle cable and the uh, steering arm for the uh, nose wheel. Now, back here, see this servo here is back down to the level that it should have been up here in the servo tray. Uh, I moved it back. Well, actually, this is the elevator, and the one then beside of it on the other side is the um, rudder. So I just moved them back behind the cutout, and they are at the height that they would normally have been all along, just uh, that they have been moved back. So this one, of course, the the uh, well, the push rod runs where it would have been before, and the other one on the other side for the uh, rudder is the same. The only thing I had to modify on on the other side, the one on the other side, the cable that goes up to the nose wheel had to be um, put in a different location, not because the servo was uh, in a in a different height, but because the of uh, this uh, cutout here. See, the servo tray only goes to about this point here. So I filled in the rest of the roof and run it all the way to the bulkhead. Well, when I did that, that meant that the, uh, that the uh, steering cable couldn't gradually uh, go down and out. It had to either go r drastically uh, down and out uh, which I, I couldn't do that. I mean, you you just you're going to cause too much um, bind. In fact, in this kit, they sent a uh, uh, a small music wire, so uh, you would have to have basically a straight shot. Well, I couldn't do that, and I couldn't use the music wire, so I used a cable with a, a plastic uh, outer sheath and um, rebored my holes. And of course, on with this Fultz nose wheel, the steering arm had to come out at a much lower uh, place in the firewall than it would have on the original landing gear. So I had to completely reroute this thing. So uh, in a few minutes, I, I'm going to take the hatch cover off, take the gas tank and everything out, so I can show you exactly where this ended up. And I'll show you what I did up here. Uh, get a good close shot on the nose gear and show you where the uh, cable had to come out and of course I I beefed up the uh, the steering uh, normally uh, you know we were talking earlier uh, I've had bad uh, things happen to me with nose wheels they they were always a weak point in the airplane especially the steering so I put some uh, hefty uh, connectors and things up there, and I'll show it to you here in a few minutes. But here's what I, the, where the servos are now on the inside. They're on top, these two here are on top of the uh, uh, servo tray, and you can see there's still plenty of room here uh, from here up, and so they don't bother the um, uh, aileron servo at all. There's absolutely no problem because this airplane is big enough till there's so much room in there that there's just no problem. So you just move the elevator and uh, rudder servo back behind the cutout and put you some servo rails across there and, and just mount them. Now um, on this, um, the instructions that came with this uh, said that uh, you have to be careful because this airplane will come out tail heavy. Well, w uh, when I put the engine on, uh, I put the engine as far forward on the engine mount as it would go. And um, I've got the uh, battery and everything up under the tank. And um, I was afraid when I moved these servos back that it, that that would cause a, a problem. Uh, and with this no this landing gear here is a lot heavier than the original. I thought I'd have a problem with that, but I guess the weight of that 
Fultz nose wheel and the engine being as far forward as I could get it has worked because when the, this plane was finished, uh, I checked it out and it balanced exactly the way a plane should balance. It was all oh, just a couple of degrees low in, at the nose and uh, it, it couldn't have been better. So it, it just it came out perfectly. I have no uh, problems at all. And of course this cut out here, if you'll notice is, uh, well, I don't know exactly where the CG is, but it's somewhere along about here. So your parachute guy's hanging exactly on the CG. So there's no problem loaded or unloaded. The CG doesn't change. So it's, um, it's a wonderful flying airplane. Uh, so now I'm going to um, take the uh, hatch off and get the tank out and show you inside uh, how I routed this, these uh, cables. And then I'll show you some good close-ups of the nose wheel and the connectors and the way I use them. And uh, well, maybe before I show you that, I think maybe I'll show you uh, a couple of uh, jumps that uh, the little SOB here has uh, uh, done for us. Uh, it, I guess I told you earlier we've got 60 jumps with, uh, with this little dude and we've never had a problem, not one problem with the nose wheel or the drop mechanism or anything. Um, well, I had a little problem once with the engine on takeoff roll. I had to uh, abort my takeoff because I had left the uh, a pressure uh, line uh, loose on the muffler and the engine leaned out and quit before I, before, luckily before I rotated and got off the ground. So I just went and put the uh, hose back on the muffler and went ahead and took off. Uh, but this has been a, oh, it's been a fine airplane. So I think maybe I'll uh, run you a couple of jumps now that uh, the little SOB is done for us, and you can see with what ease this airplane handles at two pounds. Uh, honestly, uh, you you really, if you couldn't see your parachute dude on there, you really wouldn't know there was any extra weight on there. It's, uh, it's a marvelous uh, jump plane.
Okay, we're back. Now, I guess you noticed, of course, that I didn't put any music or anything to to those jumps, and the reason I didn't, I wanted you to be able to hear the engine and, and everything uh, together, you know, the engine, the, the sound, and the way it was climbing and everything. Um, it's just a, it's a marvelous combination, that engine, the OS-46 FX, and uh, this, this airplane, I, I, I just can't uh, say enough good things about it. It's, uh, it has made a wonderful drop plane. Now we have a, um, a larger drop plane. I don't know if you've looked at our website or not, but uh, we have a Robin Hood 99. Uh, we've got, I've got a, I might show you a, one of uh, the drops from it. Uh, although it, it's not the plane that I'm uh, showing you how to modify, but I think you might be interested in seeing. We dropped two parachutists. Uh, we have dropped three from it. It's designed to drop three. But every time we have ever dropped three parachutists, our camera dude always misses it because it's, it's always directly overhead and they t fall over backwards and all kinds of stuff. But we did get one with two two uh, jumpers coming off of it. I'll, I'll show you this. Uh, I mean, I, it has nothing to do with uh, the modification of this airplane, but I'll show you how uh, how good two look coming down, and you can imagine three, how good it looks, but uh, I don't have any on tape. Maybe someday I'll get a guy that can stand up long enough <laughs> to uh, get us a shot. can't see the whole nose wheel but anyway see this um, thing here this well this here <laughs> uh, I, in the past I've always had problems with uh, the linkage coming loose and uh, you know nose wheels laying down on me so I thought if I was going to have a nose wheel this time I would try to make it as best as strong as I could and uh, now if you'll notice I've got a pretty big hole gouged out there it doesn't need to be quite that big but the reason i did it of course you can see it moves like from side to side so i had to have uh, enough uh, to where it would uh, not catch and what that is is a uh, well let's see here if i can see it on camera uh, it's a 
Dubro 440 bottle link. And, uh, it, this one is that I've got here in this package is an adjustable one. The one that I've got on the here isn't adjustable, but you could use either one of them. It wouldn't matter. But when you put one of these on there, uh, and you've got a good hefty uh, steering arm, uh, you're just not going to have much uh, trouble. Now, one of the reasons also that I've got that uh, big hole in there, this uh, adjustable uh, ball link here uh, is kind of large and flat back there on the back, and if you have just a little hole, it could, that thing could catch on the edge of the hole, cause you a problem. So what I've done, I've just made sure that the hole was big enough till it couldn't catch. And you see that smaller hole up above there, that's where the original uh, throttle cable was supposed to come through. Uh, but the old uh, nose wheel, of course, had uh, a different uh, arm on it and a little bit different arrangement. So I had to move that hole lower and uh, I've just left the holes there I considered plugging them up but uh, I haven't yet and I guess I should but I fuel proofed everything good and so far uh, as far as I know we've not had any thing much going back in there but really uh, as long as I guess as long as you've got it fuel proofed real good and there doesn't get to be gallons of it in there it'll be all right but if you like you can do a better job than I have, but uh, you just want to make sure that that uh, nose, that that steering doesn't catch on the edge of your firewall. Now that is a cable. I don't know if any of you have used cable on a steering arm before, but it's possible. I mean, it it's as strong as any uh, wire because the cable that's inside the uh, plastic tube cannot do anything except go forward and back. It can't kink up. And what I always do, uh, I solder enough on the ends of the cable to where uh, everything that comes out the end of the plastic cable is soldered uh, so it's stiff. And I do the same thing back in the fuselage so that when you hook this thing up, for all intents and purposes, you've got a solid rod out through there except it's flexible um, and this uh, steering arm I have in the past had problems with the thing uh, coming loose and swiveling on the uh, the nose wire so this time I did what they always say oh take a file and make a flat spot well there's no way it really works uh, after 60 flights we've it, I have never had to tighten it or anything. Um, so it, it has worked out very, very nicely. Uh, now I'm going to take the um, hatch off the uh, tank uh, compartment and take the tank out and get down in there and show you how I routed those, um, uh, the push rod for the steering and the uh, throttle cable. Um, now the throttle is it's a cable as well uh, but I've done it the same way you just solder what is uh, what comes out the end of the tube and uh, then do the same on the inside and when you push the cable through your uh, uh, keepers on your servos arms and tighten it down it won't splay that cable out if you don't solder it tighten it down <coughs> it'll splay it out and it's all right until you have to take it out then you can't get it back in there <coughs> so i solder enough on the end to where that uh that is just like a solid rod and when you clamp down on it no problem you can take it in and out time after time and it won't uh, splay the cable out so if you use this nose gear and an arrangement is set up sort of like what I've got here. It doesn't have to be exactly the same, but you know, you need a pretty good hefty arrangement, then you're not going to have any trouble with your nose gear.
Okay, now inside the tank compartment here, there is a, uh, a shelf that the tank sits on. And then I guess that's to make it easier than for you to be able to slide your battery and everything up underneath there. Well, um, like here is the uh, throttle cable. Now that is, oh, I had to move it up maybe an inch, but that's no problem because it's all above the shelf. Uh, and back here in the in this uh, in the bulkhead back here, uh, I had to uh, uh, drill a, a different hole. But that's no problem. It's easy to get to. But now this uh, cable here that uh, goes to the steering arm, it was going to have to go below this. Uh, so I had to, if you, you notice here, I had to make this cut out. I just cut this out and then put screws in it so that I could screw it back down. So I'll uh, go ahead and take this out and then we'll look on down in there. Okay, now you can see this uh, throttle cable right here. Now what this is, I used, uh, this is an inner part of a blue nirod. And uh, the inner part of the blue nirod is exactly the right size for a 1 16th inch cable to go through. And when you put it through that thing and then solder the ends, it's just just as good as a solid piece of wire. Well, a lot better, it'll go around curves. But when you solder the ends of it, you want to take into account how much of a um, uh, bend or a curve you've got in it. So if you uh, solder too much, then it'll be stiff, and when you go to run your cable up through there, it won't go around the curve. So uh, at times, if you've got a real big bend in it someplace, you might just have to go ahead and run it on through there and then solder the other end of the cable uh, after you run it through. Uh, but it makes a great push rod uh, when you have to uh, have some uh, something that's that's flexible. Now, I uh, I ran this. Of course, I had to put it down lower than uh, than what the original cable was. But there's no problem. I just augured me out a hole. Now this firewall, inside and out, uh, again uh, maybe it's overkill but uh, I've had no problems. But I fiberglass this firewall on the inside and on the outside, inside and out. And I put um, corner blocks inside. Well, it, it may have already had them inside. I don't even remember. Some of them do and some of them don't, but I don't remember this one. But whether it did or not, if it hadn't, if I, I would have put them in there. So you can see the corner blocks here. Then. As a, another precaution, I put uh, corner blocks on the um, uh, outside of the firewall. And then after I did that, then is uh, when I fiberglassed it. So this thing has never given me a minute of trouble. And I think the reason it hasn't is because I took a little extra time to, to take these precautions and beef this thing up. and. Uh, I've been very, very happy with it. It took a little bit of time, not not much. Uh, I guess cutting this little old square out right here was as time consuming as anything. But it, you could see I didn't take much pains with it. I just hogged it out. But it works. It, it, it serves its purpose. So just remember, yeah, I would recommend fiberglassing uh, this firewall inside and out, putting corner blocks if it doesn't have them on the inside, I think it does, but I cannot remember. But in, at any rate, put the corner blocks uh, in all four places here, then fiberglass inside and out, and then drill your holes out. Um, that's what I did anyway, because the holes are already there. So I just like crammed uh, oh, balsa wood in, in the holes, and then when the fiberglass began to cure, cure I didn't wait till it got as hard as a rock, uh, but I, I waited until it got hard enough to where you could bore through it without it gumming up. 
and and then just do your trimming of your fiberglass and then bore your holes before it gets rock hard and um, it has really worked out fine for us it's just it's done great okay now the uh, steering cable of course uh, the uh, rudder servo is back here and it's down at the level it should be and so the the cable travels right along the top of the servo tray and of course when it gets out here where the cutout is it has to go at a fairly good angle uh, downward so all I did I took a long bit and just started here and bored it at what angle I thought it needed to be and it worked out so I just shoved the that uh, inner yellow nye rod part down into here and then made a well it's a fairly short bend but it's nothing that the uh, cable couldn't handle and ran it along not completely to the bottom but almost to the bottom up here to the firewall bored my new hole like I showed you there a minute ago and made it big enough to where that uh, this um, ball link would not catch on the edge of it and then I uh, uh, made a flat spot on this music wire in the landing gear and tightened it down. Now I want to show you how I made uh, this uh, little old piece here you can see that hole uh, let me get my uh, uh, radio over here just a second. Okay, now there's a close-up of that, uh, excuse me here, that thing. I don't know if you can see that music wire when it uh, goes in and out there. Yeah, you can see it. So, you see, you drill that hole big enough to where you know that it's uh, not going to... Uh, that your wire is not going to catch on the edge of it and give you grief. Uh, and then when you uh, capture your thing here, I'll show you uh, this. Uh, just, this is just a little old electrical, you know, thing. I don't know what they're called, but anyway, that's all that is. And it's just crimped onto this. Uh, this is a braided nylon cord and it's just crimped on there and I put a little hot stuff on it just uh, to be sure but let you see how this works uh, I missed it. there you go now see that it can't slip off there it just can't it, it's not possible and there's just no way that's going to come out of there uh, and I'll show you how I made this little piece. It is so simple. Now, I epoxied it on there, and then I drilled a hole through here and put a, a 440 bolt through it. I mean, it's kind of maybe overkill, but I, I just didn't want to take the chance that the epoxy might uh, come loose uh, and drop my dude prematurely. So I glued it and bolted it. And on the inside here... Uh, I reinforced it. I put uh, 16 inch uh, plywood. Well, no, that's probably 8 inch. 8 inch plywood on the inside where the bolt goes through uh, to reinforce it so uh, that it wouldn't tear this uh, balsa loose. This this crutch in here is uh, it has holes, you know. And then and then there's balsa. So this went uh, where the balsa part is. So I just put uh, uh, plywood in there to reinforce it. And I did the same thing on the other side where the cam lock is. Now, uh, I'm going to uh, get my stuff together here and show you how I made this part and how I made the, well, uh, Wally Gitchell gave me this cam lock, but then I made uh, uh, the others for our Robin Hood 99. They're simple to make but boy they are so effective and it eliminates the need for rubber bands because uh, with this uh, cam lock over here 
you can, uh, well, let me get, now I don't have my parachute dude out here, but I've got uh, Dick Northam's dude here. Uh, I'll just stick him up in there. But you can uh, cinch this down. I don't know if you can see what I'm doing here or not. Let me go move the camera a little bit so you can. I'll just put old Hubert under here. A little awkward to get at it from here, but I think I can manage. Just stick him in here and show you how this thing works. switch see it lets him loose it says let's Hubert happen okay now we're going to uh, make one of these uh, little cam locks and the dimensions of Wally's is it's three quarters of an inch wide and inch and a half tall. We'll saw out a couple of parts here.
Okay, now we'll put them together. <clears throat> okay, now I'll uh, give you the dimensions of these. Um, the uh, the one that Wally made for me, uh, the uh, it's uh, three quarters of an inch wide here, and from here up to here is an inch and a half. Now this little piece right in here, this it's just a little spacer that glues right in there, and that's a quarter of an inch wide and half an inch, quarter of an inch wide, half an inch long. And then this spacer goes right on top of that, just like that. And then see the little arm in that that leaves it just exactly, uh, this is all one eighth inch thick stuff. So that leaves just exactly enough for his arm there. Now, he's got a uh, hold board here and here and here and here. That that secures it to the airplane. You can put, uh, you'd need to put countersink screws there so that this little uh, arm would um, go over the tops of those uh, heads of those screws. And then he's got a this little spacer in here is, is glued in there, but he put a, uh, a screw through it just right here, just to uh, be sure. <laughs> and then you want to put a screw through this pa this part here and screw it all through your arm and then into the back plate. And that allows your uh, uh, cam arm to, to rotate. Now... Here, before you put your arm in there, take whatever size cord you're going to use. Now, this cord that I've got here is way too big, but anyway, I'm just, just using it for demonstration purposes here. Just take this cord and lay it here like that, and then put your little cam lock right up against it right there so you know where it has to to go to uh, to bind the the cord, and then this part, bottom part here, it works like this. See, like this. So just take a, a sander, just round that off just a little bit there, and um, then uh, you'll have this to where it'll fit the the string that you're gonna put in there. See, a lot of this, this is just. Uh, you know, try it and uh, see if it works. If it doesn't, sand it a little more. But that's basically uh, the way this is done. But it really works good. And it, you can see how terribly simple it is. But when you pull that string down through there and push that little, uh, this will be the position it will be in when it's uh, open, you see down like that. When you put your string through there and, and cinch that down, it really holds. And when you get it through there, then uh, uh, tie a knot in the top of your uh, string so that it won't keep coming out on you. Well, I've screwed it up. But anyway, you have a knot up here like this, and then it's it's not going it, to... It, well, I'm hiding it from the can. You can see, see the knot there. Well, see, that'll never come through there. So that's that's basically all there is to it. Uh, it's very, very simple. And you don't even have to use these dimensions that we've used. This is just what Wally just happened to build it this size. You could build it bigger. I don't think you'd want to build it any smaller. It gets too tedious to work with. But you could build it bigger if you like. And uh, it's simple and quick to build. And boy, does it beat rubber bands all to pieces. Because you can uh, snug that down with this cord. And, uh, and I'm, I'm going to show you now how we saw out that uh, part on the other side uh, that captures the, the little ring. Uh, it's very, very simple. It's, well, it's even simpler than this. Uh, but when you put this drop mechanism in, I'm telling you, it's as near bulletproof, I think, as you could possibly get it. I've drawn one out. Uh, I, 
I didn't make it the same size as, as the one I've got on the on the little SOB. Uh, it doesn't really matter what size you make this. I'm making this out of a piece of, well, I guess it's pine. Uh, it might be best to make it out of something else. Uh, I don't. I don't think the pine would split. But if you're not uh, comfortable with the pine, use poplar or something like that. And this is like three quarters of an inch thick. It doesn't have to be that thick. But the point is, you can make it out of anything. So I'm just going to saw it out here. got our offset there now. Yeah. Uh, I can't see my monitor, so I don't know if I'm on or not. But now all I've got left to do is drill a hole through here. Now I'll drill the hole. I've got it marked. I don't know if you can see this, but I've got it marked, and I'll just drill a hole through here. Is. Now that, that's finished. Uh, all you gotta do is glue it on. Okay, uh, now here's the little, uh, I don't know what to call this thing, <laughs> the capture block, I guess. But anyway, you can see, I think you can see there, uh, how it, uh, See, the pin would come out the side of your plane and up into that hole right there. Now, you can drill that hole bigger or whatever, just just so that it's big enough to when your pin comes out of there, it, it, it just goes right into the hole and doesn't uh, try to hit the side of it. Because if it hits the side of it, of course, it'll, you'll have a problem. Besides, your, besides your servo will be stalled and drain your battery, and then your little dude would slip off as well. And I think the reason it tears them up so bad when they fall off low, we had ours to fall off once at about 10 feet of altitude. Well, it's, I think it's because you're so low and you're going like maybe 30 miles an hour. And, uh, of course, when he hits the ground, he's still going just about 30 miles an hour. And then he goes uh, down the runway, looks like a wagon wheel with his arms and legs up in there just rolling along and pieces flying off. Whereas when you drop him out of a, a plane, he falls fairly stable, fairly uh, flat on his belly, and he, if, if his parachute doesn't open, he goes thundering into the ground. Uh, sometimes he gets broke up a little bit, but not near like he does when he gets dropped off at, at 10 feet of altitude. So you want to make sure that you always take care of your drop mechanism. Uh, keep a check on it and uh, but really, we've never had anything to go wrong with ours, but we just, you know, keep a close check on it. And, and mine, um, of course, I, I glued mine on, I think I told you before. But then after I got it on, I drilled a hole through here and ran it all the way through the airplane. 
and uh, on all of these things that I bolt onto the airplane, I, I put plywood on the inside to reinforce it. Um, just maybe it's not necessary, but uh, I, I kind of like to uh, try to avoid to trouble when I can. So sometimes maybe I go a little overboard, but uh, we've we've uh, done pretty well. So uh, I guess we've almost got it right anyway. Now I think this is everything that uh, I needed to show you about uh, modifying the plane. It's uh, you can see it's no big uh, big deal. It uh, just takes a little time, but not even much time. Okay, uh, that's about it. Uh, but now this uh, is a uh, like I said before, Sig Cadet LT40 ARF. And it it doesn't mean that you, you know that you've got to use this this same airplane because there are any number of uh, kits and ARFs. A lot of people wouldn't even uh, you know would never think about using an ARF for something like this. But uh, the ARFs today are really great airplanes. They're they're made well, and especially uh, those like this uh, Sig Cadet uh, ARF that are covered with. Uh, the real plastic covering and not that uh, sticky shelf paper type stuff. These these are just really great to work with. Uh, and, and if you damage one, knock a hole in it or something, it's easy to patch. But uh, you can use virtually any, any trainer, 40 size trainer, as a drop plane. Uh, now this one is a little, has a little more wingspan than a lot of them, but uh, most any train any trainer with like a 60 60 or 65 inch wingspan it'll haul this thing with with no trouble at all uh, so um, I hope this is helpful to you and I, I hope it helps you to get uh, get things ready and get your skydiver built and uh, ready to come to the RC skydiver rally um, uh, well, it's in September. It was September last year. It's going to be September this year. A little bit later in September. Last year it was like uh, around the 1st of September. And, and uh, this year it's going to be like towards the end of the month. But it's a great time. Uh, and um, well, I hope I hope to see you there. Because uh, the uh, Lord's willing and the creek don't rise. Uh, I'm going to be there, me and Jamie and uh, uh, Tony and Richie. Uh, we're going to be there. We're really looking forward to it. So I'm, I will uh, leave you with a, about a couple of more jumps uh, uh, before I go. So uh, we look forward maybe to seeing you on a, a tape uh, in the future where we're going to make some more. I think I'm going to put one together of just parachute jumping of the uh, thrills and perils, <laughs> the thrill of victory and agony of defeat. <laughs> so uh, maybe we'll see you then. Okay, happy jumping. <laughs>